So what's exciting in reinforcement learning research today? For machines, when you're learning from scratch, to them, they're just seeing numbers on a, on a vector. Right. or even on a matrix if you're looking at images. Then how, how fast can you actually learn from that? So how much is it is actually the inefficiency in our algorithm versus um, the total compute history required from scratch to learn something? Reframing RL in different paradigm. So one way is to kind of find ways to reframe it. Can, it, can you transform it into a, a, let's say, a supervised learning problem? Kang. Welcome to the podcast. It's awesome to have you here. Thank you for making the journey to my apartment to film in Lower Manhattan. Uh, you had a long commute over from Brooklyn, is that right? Yeah, it's super long, only like 10 minutes <laughs> on the subway, four stops away. Nice, that isn't bad. And it's nice we get to catch up a lot mm. more closely before and after shooting. Yeah. And I hadn't seen you in years. So I used to know you uh, with some regularity. I used to see you with some regularity. So in 2018, we were introduced by Deborah Williams, who's an acquisitions editor at Pearson. Uh, so my book, Deep Learning Illustrated, was published by Pearson, uh, and Deborah Williams was the acquisitions editor. And then same thing, your book, Foundations of Deep Reinforcement Learning, which was published in 2020, was also uh, published by Pearson, and yep. Deborah worked on that book too. And so I can't remember in what context she introduced us, but she was like, you've got to meet Hang and Laura, the authors of this book. And then both of you ran, so at that time in 2018, I was running this in-person deep learning study group in New York, which was pretty cool because we had this specific curriculum that all of us had followed. So everybody had a pretty good understanding of deep learning in general, convolutional neural networks for machine vision. We'd done recurrent neural networks and other kinds of natural language processing approaches mm -hmm. for handling natural language data. So uh, people, you know, we kind of had this baseline level of understanding and we really wanted to learn deep reinforcement learning as a group. And so then it was perfect that at that same time, Deborah introduced me to you and Laura, yeah. two deep reinforcement learning experts. And so you came in and offered two day long workshops. So you came in, so uh, my deep learning study group sessions 15 and 16, I'll provide a link in the show notes to those so that people can see exactly what was covered in those sessions. But uh, the two of you, ran on Saturdays these like four or five hour long workshops that yeah, were hands so. on. Mm -hmm. And yeah, those were really super cool. So really appreciate you doing that. Um, and then and then you left. <laughs> <laughs> you went to the Bay Area right. for work. Yep. But now very recently you're back in New York City. Yeah, and for good. For good. For good. It's I love to hear that. Well, now your wife co-owns a restaurant in the East Village, mm -hmm. so it's a good reason to stay. <laughs> yep, totally. I know. Um, so clearly you're an expert in deep reinforcement learning, so let's dig right into what that is. So I'm going to give my own kind of quick intro to it, and then you can take it away. So we can use machine learning or other statistical approaches for tackling different kinds of problems. So if we're able to have labeled data, like you have a thousand pictures and five of them are labeled as dogs, five of them are labeled as cats, then you have this labeled data set and you can train something called a supervised learning algorithm to work with those labeled data. In other scenarios, you might not have labels for your data. So you could have a whole bunch of natural language data, like all of the English on the internet, and you could train some unsupervised learning models with that kind of uh, data set. Reinforcement learning is a third category of problem that is uh, completely different and really super cool because with reinforcement learning, the algorithm interacts with something called an environment and that changes the data. Right. So with those other two paradigms, those other two main paradigms, supervised learning, unsupervised learning, you can just kind of have a trained data set and you can just keep working with it over and over. But with reinforcement learning, every time you kind of, you run your algorithm, you're getting, you're training with new data that has maybe never been created before. Um, and so, yeah, so tell us a bit more about that, about reinforcement learning. So the way I see it is that it simply learns from trial and error. So you expose what we call an agent, which is uh, the learning uh, model or the agent at work. So you expose it to an environment, it kind of interacts with the environment in real time. And there is basically a feedback loop. 
So you do something in the environment that then feeds back to you and then you decide what to do next. And that all then feeds back to the, um, we call it the objective function. So you're trying to maximize something. So in this case, in reinforcement learning, it's the reward. And that's also an interesting topic, like how do you assign a reward? So typically the obvious case is like playing games. So a lot of times it's easy to say that um, that's how you explain deep R to people. It's just like a game playing agent because that's like the perfect example for reinforcement learning. Right, so if you have an algorithm that's playing a Tetris video game, right. it's very easy to say, well, our objective is to get the highest score possible mm -hmm. in Tetris. So every time the agent is playing the game, it, uh, it first it learns how to take simple actions. So it first figures out right. that pressing the right key yeah. is going to move the Tetris piece right and left is left. And so it figures out these simple associations. And then through kind of random trial and error, it eventually figures out that some of the movements lead to points. And then you, you have it do more and more. It, mm -hmm. it maximizes this, these kinds of point scores. So it figures out what kinds of actions lead to higher and higher points. Right, exactly. So the same thing happens in um, robotics. So you can think of robotics as a robot kind of playing games in, in the real world. But um, of course, it's more, there are more real consequences to that because robot resides in the real world and interacts with say people or objects. Right. But yeah, that's the general gist. And an interesting thing there is that with some of these real world applications, because it could take so long or be so expensive to accumulate real world training data, mm -hmm. often uh, even real world applications of deep reinforcement learning train on video games, right? So a robot arm, you could have it learn how to perform a task in a simulation first with simulated data and then maybe you can just fine tune that mm -hmm. in, in the real world. So, right, that, that's, that's, a, that's a huge difference between, if you look at how a human play video games, like the Atari suite of games, versus how a robot plays it. So a human probably takes a few tries and then directly, oh, you just get better and better over time, maybe in less than 10 trials. But for, um, I, I don't wanna say a robot, but for, for an machine. agent, yeah, for a machine to do that, there, there is a way we measure um, the samples or the, the data samples that we use to train. It's called a frame. So basically one video frame is like one data point. And that's in the millions, uh, right. if not billions. So actually right. in recent years we have reached like billions, even like hundreds of billions. And that's a lot of um, video game playing. So you'd see news headlines that, that say, oh, this uh, OpenAI, uh, Dota bot plays thousands of years worth of uh, Dota and then compete against humans. Right. But that's like the, the sample efficiency of um, reinforcement learning. At least the sample inefficiency. Yeah, inefficiency, exactly. Yeah. So at least for now. And yeah, so that, that is something I think we'll talk about the kind of the problems in this mm -hmm. approach and in the future of research. So we'll get to that later in the episode. But yeah, that's a really interesting point. These, these, the way that we set up deep reinforcement learning algorithms today or any AI algorithms really I think people, if they're not already practicing data scientists working with AI algorithms, you have this idea that they know things <laughs> and that they reason, but they don't at all. And this deep reinforcement learning uh, inefficiency that you're describing is a perfect mm -hmm. example because unlike a person, even a child who can pick up a controller and say, okay, you know, it instantly makes sense that pressing right, right is going to move the Tetris block right and left is going to move it left. But the algorithm comes without even that simple knowledge of the world. Yeah. And so even the simplest things, you know, the idea of what could possibly be the objective in this game, you know, for a kid when they're, when they're seeing the Tetris blocks, they're like, okay, like fitting these together. Or somebody could even just say a sentence to them. You're trying to fit the blocks together without there being any gaps. Mm -hmm. And in a single sentence, the kid's like, oh, okay, I know what to do. But you can't explain that to a deep reinforcement learning algorithm. So it takes billions of frames like you're describing yeah. for it to figure it out by accident. Right, right. So that, that also brings up an interesting point. So there is, I guess, you can call this concept of um, computation history. So basically the question is how much of it is in it, like built into to us, like hardwired in, in our body and brain versus how much is learned on the spot. So I think things like language for us, it takes us many years to learn language. Right. So that, that would be something that's not hardwired at least. Um, not like deeply hardwired, but for for machines, then if you look at 
why does it take billions of frames? Like, is it possible to shrink it down to maybe thousands of frames, or just like, like how humans do it um, in dozens of episodes of, of a game? Um, the thing with human is that we have priors, we have like real world experience, we have a a really astonishing, well, a really amazing ability to transfer what we know before and right. apply it to gaming. So. Like we know how buttons work, we know what's uh, left, right, up, down. We know like about spatial spatial concepts, but for machines, when you are learning from scratch, to them you, they're just seeing numbers on a on a vector, right. or even on a matrix if you are looking at images. Right. So then, how how fast can you actually learn from that? So how much is it is actually the inefficiency in our algorithm versus um, the total compute history required from scratch? To learn something, so for human, you can argue that our compute history actually traces back way back to our ancestors, and actually, it might be billions right. of uh, frames also. Right. <laughs> so yeah, that's that's just like something that we kind of like think uh, about in terms of cool. efficiency. Yeah. I hadn't thought of that. That's a really good point. Um, so, an interesting for you to mention, kind of going back really far in human mm. history. So maybe we won't do a whole history, like archaeological <laughs> history of humans and human cognition. Yeah. Though I can definitely recommend a great book to get a glimpse of that is *Sapiens* by Yuval Noah Harari. Yeah. I love that book for kind of understanding human history and our own cognitive abilities. Um, but let's let's go over a a history of reinforcement learning. Mm -hmm. Oh, and we didn't talk about how. So we talked about this reinforcement learning paradigm. Right. What makes something deep reinforcement learning as opposed to just reinforcement learning? All right. So reinforcement learning is the paradigm of learning from trial and error. So you have the data points are basically state, action, reward, and you repeat that over time. So you roll it out in time. But what makes it deep is that what, how you are learning um, the functions in reinforcement learning. So in the typical setup, without deep uh, any consideration of um, like deep or not deep, you are learning say the objective function or uh, sometimes you learn the transition function basically when you're modeling the world and how do you learn that so from those four data points um, there are a bunch of other functions that I can learn from just just these data points and what makes it deep is of course the function approximation uh, component of it so you're using a deep neural network to learn those functions and then apply them so right. traditionally it's mostly like tabular or dynamic programming but since we well since DeepMind discovered how to use Deep learning to learn those functions. There has just been an explosion of like right, deep right, algorithms right. and achievements. So through the '80s, the '90s, the first decade of this millennium, uh, reinforcement learning problems were being solved, but they were primarily using non-deep learning, non-neural network approaches right. to figure out what kind of function we should be learning uh, inside the algorithm. And then, as you mentioned, DeepMind in recent years made a lot of breakthroughs. I think first with playing Atari video games, that was the first big paper, right? Yeah. Maybe I'm, you're about to tell us about the history, so <laughs> uh, I don't need to, but, uh, but basically, uh, so the difference between reinforcement learning and deep reinforcement learning is that with deep reinforcement learning, you're using a neural network, perhaps a deep neural network, to learn something as opposed to using some other kind of uh, learning approach. When I talk to leaders in data science, I notice they all make time for learning and encourage the same of their teams. But with your actual everyday work to do, all day trainings aren't possible for most of us. That's why an on-demand learning platform like Udemy Business makes sense. With Udemy Business, you can access over 500 cutting edge data science courses taught by real world subject matter experts and validated by other learners' real time reviews. Amongst these 500 courses, you'll find my own Mathematical Foundations of Machine Learning course, as well as dozens of mega popular courses from other super data science instructors. To hear the latest on the state of data science in the workplace and discover how you can democratize data science learning in your teams through Udemy Business, check out the new video series called Insights on Demand, Diving into Data Science. To watch this series and learn more, visit business.udemy.com SDS. That's business.udemy.com SDS. Cool, all right, so we've gotten that over. Hopefully we haven't stepped on the toes too much of the history that you're gonna get now. <laughs> um, no, really, so um, the history goes back, I think reinforcement learning is a really old field. You can, it goes by a different name also. So there's Ooh. control theory. Ah, control so theory. So that's actually the same thing as um, reinforcement uh, learning. Mm. And there's also um, 
inventory management. So, so it takes many different forms, but overall the mathematical formulation is the same. So we have the four tuple, the state reward action, oh, and, state and action are yeah, SARS, yeah. SARS, <laughs> and so the, the history. So I guess we should start from the most significant achievement of uh, reinforcement learning. So I have this page on my uh, GitHub that I keep a track of um, the timeline. So nice. We'll put that in the show notes for sure. Yeah, in I think right. Let's see. It goes so it's actually much older than most people that I talked to uh, thought. Oh, is, is this something new? Because um, it got popular after DeepMind. Exactly. But really, it came, I think you can go back as far as 1983. So that, that was the first actor critic algorithm. And it was already being used, but of course. Actor critic algorithm was in 1983. Yeah. Right. Wow. So, yeah, it's, it's pretty old. So, and then you have like the first um, convolutional net in 1989. Yann Lequin. Yeah. And then the same year, you have Q learning. But that was like still tabular and non-deep version but the, right. the whole concept of like how do you bootstrap your your um, learning function and then feedback and then keep on like learning to approximate the value better and better um so that's q learning 1989 right and then in 1991 we have td gammon so that's using td that's a method um it's called temporal difference you it's used to play backgammon and <laughs> then and probably other applications too, but that was a famous one. Yeah, that was a famous one. It was one kind of a big use. breakthrough that people were surprised that you could you could play backgammon very well. Mm -hmm. So that was before we had the whole deep blue thing yep. of cast. Oh, maybe you're getting to that. <laughs> but, actually, actually, no. I think yeah, it wasn't. It well, because that wasn't deep reinforcement learning. learning. No. Yeah, it but was it was a different method. In the late '90s, that you had deep blue playing chess against Kasparov, the world's right. best human player, and now it seems like we have computers beating the best humans at lots of different things. But in the early 90s, at this relatively complex cognitive task, backgammon, yep. really fun game, by the way, one of my favorites, um, you had computers that could play it extremely well. So that yeah. was a big breakthrough. Yeah, actually also, that, that's a good point. Like chess, Deep Blue wasn't reinforcement learning. Right, but then right. the, the, the strongest uh, computer today is a deep reinforcement learning algorithm. Of course we'll get into is. that later. Yeah. So, and then 1992, that's when Reinforce came out. So that's also a very canonical algorithm. We actually include uh, in, in the book yep. uh, that we published. And let's see. So 2013, that's when DQN came out. So that is the first uh, deep reinforcement learning algorithm that became popular because it defeated the human. Right, well, right, right. Actually, not versus a human, as in it achieved like a superhuman level score? Yeah, at, at video games, at Atari yeah. video games, right? right? And at several of them. So uh, to tie a few things together, so you'd mentioned that Q learning, this approach, and actually you've mentioned a few of them. So I think all of these are covered in your book. So Q learning, which has been around since the 80s, mm -hmm. that's covered in your book. Reinforce, which was introduced in 1992, that's yep. covered in your book. The actor critic algorithm that you talked about in 1985 or 83, yeah. Yeah. that also is, I imagine, it's gotta be covered in your book because it's still one of the big reinforcement learning algorithms today. Right. But this big thing, there was this jump, so kind of lots of big breakthroughs in the mid 80s to the early 90s in reinforcement learning in general. But then it was in 2013 with people at DeepMind, mm -hmm. uh, it was Vladimir Nim, uh, I think was the first author on that paper. Yeah, that, yeah. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so this idea of, of using a neural network to learn a function in the reinforcement learning algorithm that ended up being this big breakthrough. And then all of a sudden, uh, and so it was one algorithm I think that could have superhuman ability at several different Atari games. Right, right. So, so the whole journey actually took them um, about two years. So DQN came out in 2013, but it actually took until 2015, February, for them to achieve a human level control in Atari. Uh, so yeah, that, that's quite a journey. So that, that's like the same thing that we're gonna see over and over with deep minus one. Like they published something and then that's the first draft, and then they iterate over it, and then improve it significantly. Right. Um, and then I think in 2015, that was the the start of like this explosion of um, activities in in deep RL. So you have people building on top of what DeepMind published, so the DQN, and then you kind of like try to modify and improve on DQN. Mm -hmm. um, so you get something like oh, double DQN, where you have like two networks to learn the <laughs> the, the the same function, the, the Q function, right. what you call it. Um, or you have like a dueling DQN, or you have like adding prioritized experience replay to, to your DQN, stuff like that. Um, so 
2015, a busy year. And I think TensorFlow came out 2015, November. Um, and then you get um, some more activities in 2016. So that's when AlphaGo came out, actually. And right. uh, they, they beat the champion, Lisa Dole, um, 4 yeah. to 1. Spoiler alert if you watch Spoiler the AlphaGo alert. documentary. Uh, the computers win. Yes. Um, amazing documentary, though. I highly recommend checking that out. Yeah, you can, totally. It's it's available on Netflix, but I think it's also freely available on YouTube for anyone in the world to see. Yeah, I think so. And, and really cool. And it's a kind of documentary, so it's about deep reinforcement learning, but it talks so much about the people involved in it, both on this, the Google DeepMind side as well as on uh, you know the, the player side. Mm -hmm. It, it makes a really nice human story, and so it's the kind of uh, deep reinforcement learning documentary that you could watch with your partner who isn't interested in machine learning. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> um, right. Cool. Yeah, so AlphaGo, that was a huge breakthrough, uh, because then, so Go is, I think it's the world's most popular board game, but yeah. it's not super yeah. popular in the West. Right. Um, and it, it's very, very computationally complex much more computationally complex than backgammon or chess. Right. And so I think some people thought it could be many decades before we had a computer that could beat expert mm -hmm. Go players, and then here we have an algorithm that could beat the world's best. Right, right. And, and the game is actually very simple. It's just like a grid, and then you try to uh, surround your enemy. Right. So you remember like all the kids in, in Asia, where I'm from, would also like play it during like recess. You just really? got like, yeah, you, so you have like, our, our books are not lined, but they're grid. Right. So, because you write like Chinese characters, and then you can also like use that to play uh, Go. Oh, so, that's cool. So you just you have this grid that's designed for writing Chinese characters. Yeah, but you could just kind of you could draw a square around it. Yeah, you can draw like circle or axis depending on like. So on on the real board, you use like black and white pieces, black and white stones. Yeah, yeah. Just draw your stuff. Cool. So and then in 2017, PPO came out. So PPO stands for Proximal Policy Optimization. That's by John Schulman, and in just a month, um, well, actually, a month after the paper came out, they started applying that to Dota. So Dota is a very popular um, computer game. Yeah, um, it's five on five. You're basically uh, fighting team against team. You have like a throne to take, and you control these characters called heroes and have abilities. And it's a very rich um, real time strategy game. I would say also like reflex game. So because right. you're trying to like micromanage everything. I, I played Dota. <laughs> You, you can't tell by now. Well, I was like, that is the best yeah, explanation yeah. of Dota I've ever heard. Here's a guy who's really done his research for the episode. Um, so when you're if, when you say five versus five, you control one player controls all five characters. So no, one player controls one hero. Right, right, right. You have so, so you, you have like five. So people. you play with four friends. Yeah, I play with four friends, yeah. and it takes like communication. So usually you would go to like an internet cafe and you talk to your teammates and then right. try to like strategize. Right. So it's a really fun uh, and like. It's, it's strategy on the macro level, but on the micro level, there's also like your finger control. And you're trying to do like a million things in, in a few seconds, and that takes a lot of coordination. So it's been known for, for a long time that it's a very hard like game to play for, for humans. And because also it's so rich because there are so many things in the game that you have like combination of like different abilities, different items. And there's like some math involved as well. Okay, do you like uh, buy certain things? How to budget your money and stuff like that. Right. So that was like one on one, uh, a restricted, ver restricted version of Dota. Um, just like shortly after the paper came out, they applied PPO to that. And they, one, so it, there's this restricted version where you just had one player against another player instead yeah. of the usual 5v5. Right. Right. So if it's one versus one, then it's less about teamwork, it's more about like your individual like, control and um, yeah. strategy. Yeah. And it took them, let's see, when did it? Oh, so it took them until like 2019, um, April. That's when OpenAI 5, so that's the, the full version of Dota, still with some like minor restrictions. That's when they went against the world champions, actually at a, at a world champion tournament. <laughs> and oh, they went really? against them. And um, yeah, so they had like a demo, and they basically defeated uh, humans. In 2019, a team of five people at the World Championship. Yeah, wow. yeah. But of course, like, it, it's it, it's not for the tournament uh, money. It's more right. for more right. for right. Um, right. yeah demo. And so going back a bit uh, in, in in terms of timeline, um, so 2017 AlphaGo. 
So AlphaGo is zero, actually. So master is Go. So you, have, you start seeing like these iterations of uh, the DeepMind algorithm. So 2017, AlphaGo zero. And then 2017, again, like December, uh, just two months after the previous one, AlphaGo, uh, sorry, AlphaGo Alpha zero. zero. Yeah. So, and, and the key things here are that, so that AlphaGo that's featured in the documentary that beats the world champion Lisa Dole a couple years earlier, um, that was trained on human gameplay. Mm -hmm. there, was, there was some training data based on human gameplay, but AlphaGo Zero, it, it had no training data. Right. So it just learned by playing against itself and making its own training data. Right, and hence the zero. Hence the zero. Yeah. And then, what was the, and then so what was the change from AlphaGo Zero to Alpha Zero? So Alpha Zero is that it doesn't get restricted to only Go. So right. Alpha Zero is no, no human knowledge, but it masters Go, chess, and another game called Shogi. Yeah, like a Japanese chess. I think so, yeah, yeah. I'm not sure. Um, so yeah, that was 2017 December. And let's see what else happens. So, and then 2018 December, so just a year later, Alpha Zero be became the strongest uh, player in history in chess, Go, and Shogi ever. So you, you see this like, progress that made by DeepMind yeah. year after year until they, they basically become the best uh, in the world. Um, so that was like, all that happened in like 2018, 2019, that's when like AlphaGo defeated Human, OpenAI 5 defeated World Champions. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, like after the OpenAI 5, I think DeepMind had to respond. So 2019, August, we have the Alpha Star. So oh. applying that to StarCraft. And actually, they're pretty good. So it's like, they call it the Grand Master level uh, in StarCraft 2. So I don't play StarCraft that much, but... Um, <laughs> I was hoping for a good detailed a... <laughs> break. Rate. So it's another, StarCraft is another video game that's like a strategy game. Yeah. Um, and very complex, I guess. And right. so what you're saying is that because a different firm, OpenAI, had been getting all the success with Dota, Dota. Um, the folks at DeepMind, who had been making all of the kind of big, uh, high popularity uh, breakthroughs in deep reinforcement learning, they, they made their own uh, kind of big splash with, with StarCraft. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, I think, um, and then we have two more years or three more, uh, three more years until, until today. So you have, um, let's see, oh, 2019 October was pretty exciting. So OpenAI solved, well, not really solving, but basically using a robot hand oh, to, yeah. to solve Rubik's Cube. Nice. So the solving algorithm is separate. I mean, it's already known uh, a computer can solve that. But to use a robot hand to control and actually solve it in the physical world, that's pretty impressive. So we have that in 2019. The alternative data industry is expected to grow tenfold in the next five years. So how will your skills and training stay competitive in this brave new world? Well. Fortunately for us, the Alternative Data Academy has just released the world's first alternative data courses aimed at working professionals through its free and on-demand training platform. The courses are taught by some of the biggest names in the alternative data space, including the prominent New York University professor Gene Exter and renowned Oxford professor Alexander Deneff. Sharpen your alternative data skills for free today with the Alternative Data Academy. All the details are online at altdata.academy. That's altdata.academy. And then 2020, um, we have something called the Agent 57. So they, it beats the human benchmark on all of the 55, well, 57 Atari games. So that, that wasn't done before because uh, you would have a new and improved algorithm that comes out and then, oh, it, it doesn't do as well in a certain category of the Atari Right, suit. right, right. Yeah. Like uh, there was something Revenge. Uh, yeah, Montezuma's Revenge. Montezuma's Revenge. Yeah. Like, so... So the early, when we were talking about deep Q learning around 2013, 2015, this breakthrough algorithm that could, that could be better than expert at a lot of Atari video games, but mm -hmm. some of them, like Montezuma's Revenge, it was right. terrible. Right. Um, and that's because, I, I guess, so some of the games in those early days, in, in or the early days of seven years ago, in 2015, uh, the, the, the deep Q learning algorithm was very good at games where all the information was right there on the screen mm -hmm. and it dealt with fast reaction times. Right, right. Um, but Montezuma's Revenge, I've never played it, but I guess you, 
you might need like to find a key in one yeah. room and then use that to open a door in another room. Right. That, that's also the problem, which I, I guess we'll get to that later. So the game is kind of like a mystery or puzzle solving game. So you have a lot of steps you have to do. You like have to like go through a door, find a stairs, go to a place, get a key. But you do all of that and then you get one reward. So oh, the reward is very sparse. Right. That's why it's, it's super hard for a, a machine to learn from the reward because you need rewards to, to learn because you're doing trial and error. But yeah. without that, you just um, can't perform as well. That's why it's a, it's a hard game. Wow. Um, but Uber's uh, Go Explore, that was the algorithm that finally solved it actually in 2018. And they, they have a different strategy of solving, solving that problem. Basically, they, they go and explore. Um, <laughs> yeah, without too much uh, technical detail. So 2020 in November, Alpha Fold came out. So that was applying uh, DeepMind's algorithm to protein folding. So mm-hmm. that's very useful for, the I guess, the medical or biological world. And then you have 2020 again, December, uh, Mu Zero uh, Masters, Go, Chess, Shogi, and Atari also. Uh, right. without, again, without rules. Um, but then you start seeing that like, progress um, slows down a little bit. Well, in the sense that it's not as frequent. You ha- don't have like so many new algorithms coming out. And anytime there's a news uh, about DeepRL, it's like bigger and also m- much more expensive but also right. more significant, so something right. like the AlphaFold. Um, and then 2021 August, that was the, I think the, the last item I have on the timeline. Um, that was when there's, so they call it um, open-ended play. So what, it, what that is, is you have a virtual environment and it's open-ended, so imagine like a, a game maker. So Unity, that's what they used. So you have like a physical environment that has RAMs, you have maybe a, like blockade, and you're trying to do like general tasks. So it's like a mini world that you put right. agents in and then they just train a bunch of different tasks. So they, so that's open-ended play. Basically just toss agents in and they, they play open-endedly. And they, what they found out was with enough of this kind of training um, or play, you get this like emergent behavior. So they're kind of, they call it generally capable agents. Uh, what what it means is you would be training on a certain task, let's say uh, chase people and tag the, the other agent uh, on a certain terrain. and then But when you transfer them to a different terrain, there are combinations that I haven't seen before, but then they were able to generalize uh, to that unseen terrain uh, scenario. Right, 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 right. So that sounds super cool as kind of your, your last piece on that timeline to kind of summarize some general themes that I kind of picked up in there. Um, it's, so we had these in the 80s, in the 90s, we had these first breakthroughs in reinforcement learning in general. Then starting in 2013, started using neural networks to solve reinforcement learning problems. And then there end up being these, these many, many uh, breakthroughs over just a few years mm-hmm. um, by using these now deep reinforcement learning algorithms. And you're saying in recent years, we're not seeing as many big breakthroughs as frequently, but when they come out, they tend to be uh, even bigger and more relevant to real world problems. So unlike playing Atari video games, Mm -hmm. um, they're folding proteins, figuring out how proteins fold or uh, using a robot hand to solve a Rubik's cube. So it sounds like, um, yeah, so we're, we're now having these very specific, but very powerful application areas come through, which is cool. Nice. All right. So that was a very interesting history of reinforcement learning. Um, so what's exciting in reinforcement learning research today? So I would say there are still a lot of problems to tackle in um, deep RL. And of course, like people are still like trying to solve that very hard. Um, I think recent, in, in, in especially the last year or last two years, we are seeing a trend of um, so one is reframing RL in different um, paradigm. So one way is to kind of find ways to reframe it. Can, it, can you transform it into a, a, let's say, supervised learning problem? So one of the more interesting approaches uh, that came out last year, I think, was using a transformer, which is like the, the buzz these days, yeah, uh, to solve language. RL. Right, because oh. you have this sequence of um, the, the, the tuples. So you have like SARIs over and over, you do something, you get a reward, and then you 
you again, like reconsider what state you are and then repeat. So people have figured out how to transform that into a sequence, feed it into a transformer. That transformer basically figures out, okay, what's gonna potentially play out. Of course, you need a lot of data to, to do that. So basically that's from like, you can collect uh, previous play data. Um, so that's one trend. And I guess a, a question that uh, people would be asking uh, after like Dota, StarCraft and Go is, is what's next? Like, is it time for general robots using uh, deep reinforcement learning? So you have um, a lot of directions to, to, to go from there. And I think the open-ended uh, play and focusing on emergent behavior, that's a right. really interesting trend as well because right. sure, it is very hard to do because basically only DeepMind could do it. That's due to the amount of compute resources you need. And also, right. like, of course, like engineering time and effort right um and then the other thing would be uh like certain ideas like people are starting to think uh in the context of like ai in general and how do you apply that um to reinforcement learning so eric jang's recent post about just ask for generalization so that's the title i think so how do you generalize uh an agent especially when it's an agent that you can basically drop it in an open world and the open world is really rich and you have to figure out how to do things, how to be efficient uh, about that. And, but in general, the problem still remains. So we have like the, the textbook examples or the textbook categories of the problems. Well, and just quickly before you go on to the problems that remain, mm -hmm. uh, that's another big trend that I didn't highlight from your history of reinforcement learning is that especially in recent years, we're seeing deep reinforcement learning algorithms that are capable of solving more and more general problems. So uh, for some of the listeners, maybe they just picked this up from what you were saying, but it's worth highlighting mm -hmm. that, so in 2013, 2015, we have these deep Q learning networks that can play more than one Atari game. So at first, I think the 2013 right. paper might've been like half a dozen mm -hmm. games. And then in 2015, it's several dozen games. Um, and then you're saying, I can't remember the exact date, but several years later then, it is expert at all of the 57 right. Tetris games. And then we see the same kind of thing with board games. So you start off with AlphaGo, which is expert at just Go. And then you have AlphaZero, which can play Go, chess, and Shogi mm -hmm. at expert level. And then later after that, you have the Alpha Mu, no, uh, Mu Zero, Mu Zero is yes. the name of it, yeah. which, um, which is capable of not only playing uh, the board games at expert level, but also Atari, Atari games, which are exactly. completely different. Mm -hmm. um, so there's this kind of this general trend towards generalization, which you were just talking about again there in the context of uh, open play. And so when you're talking about it, it in the context of open play, that probably relates to something that you just kind of touched on a few minutes ago, which is this idea of maybe being able to apply deep reinforcement learning more and more into real world robots that mm -hmm. could explore the real world. And so the general, the, the general direction that we're moving in is to such a generalization that you could have robots that just kind of figure out what they should be doing in different kinds of circumstances, which is all right. kind of a stepping stone towards artificial general intelligence, mm -hmm. which is the kind of AI that when you talk to non-data science people about right. AI, it's the AI they see on TV, mm -hmm. That you, and then when you, see, when you say, oh, I work in AI, they're like, that. they jump to this idea of artificial general intelligence yeah. that could learn anything that a person could learn. Mm. Um, and so anyway, so I, I'm, I'm speaking way too much in your episode, but um, <laughs> I just, I wanted to pick up on that one uh, more really big important theme. And uh, maybe that also helps with talking about what the limitations are mm. uh, today. Yeah, so. I think if you look at, again, like, like you said, um, if you look at a history of the type of problems that we're applying uh, RL to, if you think about the, the level of complexity, so start, starting with like TD Gammon, and then you go to Atari, where like one game at a time, but it's still like just pixels and pretty small pixels and pretty simple mechanics. Right. And then mastering a few of them, and then you go to like board game, more complex, and then Dota and Starcraft, which is even more you, you can kind of simplify it, but um, it's still really rich because there are like just so many things. So 
of course, like the goal is to eventually get to real world complexity for something to be useful in, in our world. Mm -hmm. So that's where like robotics uh, would be. And if you look at the OpenAI, the hand solving Rubik's Cube, it's still a pretty restricted um, example because you just have like camera and you kind of like have the image of the hand. The hand is fixed in a, in a stand. Yeah. But you're like starting to kind of like <laughs> reach into the real world. So of course, like to do that, there are a lot of challenges um, um, that we have to overcome. So generalization, like I said, is the, the first one. So can you generalize enough and be efficient enough? But I think um, given a trend that uh, the, the problems that we're solving are getting bigger and bigger, but also the compute is getting right. more and more. Right. So we go from a few million frames, like maybe 10 million frames for Atari to like hundreds of millions and eventually hit a billion and and then even more after that. So like the open-ended play uh, from, from last year, that was many billions, I think hundred billions of uh, frames of play because you have like right. so many different environments. They, they basically, in their, um, I think blog post, they have like a galaxy of games and then, oh, which galaxy of game like, is closer to one another? Um, you but, mean like, so like an individual round of gameplay? Or... Yeah, so it's, a, it's an open world. So maybe like this world has oh, mountain and oh, like a lake or something. Oh, and then, right. yeah, you have like a whole spectrum of like different ways you can parameterize and configure your uh, environment. Right. So that, that's also the approach that I use. So the environment is generative and you basically just let it run and then explore as much as possible and then test on like unseen ones. Right. So that, that's pretty amazing. But then, the, so so you'd have like um, this in this open-ended gameplay kind of scenario. You train an algorithm in mm -hmm. an environment where it learns how to do something in like a forest. Yeah. And then you see how well it can do something in an ocean or something. Yeah. Yeah. Or like if you learn how to throw something off a, a river, like across a river to hit something, can you do the same when there's like a, a little molehill and then you have to throw it across? Right. So that basically, so you can see it as a really simple example of testing um, like spatial awareness, for example. So, oh, do I go left, right, up, down? Right. And do I know like which direction I'm pointing at? So you start seeing those, um, these concepts um, starting to emerge. Ooh, in, so in the... this kind of ties back to what we were talking about earlier, where I was saying when you train an algorithm to play Tetris or backgammon, uh, at least until recently, they they didn't have any sort of understanding that pressing right on the joystick was going to move the block right or left right. move the left and it has to learn that from scratch. Mm -hmm. But what you're saying here is that we're you're taking the model weights from one scenario and then seeing how well they can apply those model weights in a in a different or right. a related kind of scenario. Right, exactly. So it it takes a lot of frames to do that. Um, of course, it would be amazing if we can have a robot that can navigate in the real world, like knowing like directions or mm -hmm. like spatial awareness. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the problem is you train it in the virtual world, but you have to transfer it to the real world, which is not easy because it's so different from like a simplified environment. The other option you can go is um, basically train it in the real world, but then can you train it in a reasonable amount of time to hit like millions or billions of frames that are required? Right, right, right. So you're getting to a limitation. So a big limitation in deep reinforcement learning today, I'm now putting words in your mouth, <laughs> is that it takes way too much compute. It takes, it's just too expensive to get these really cool applications. Right, exactly. So, so those two are, are the problems of generalization and also sample efficiency. So it's not sample efficient today to train uh, an, a complex RL agent in the real world, like to do useful things. So that's why you're seeing like a lot of these like delivery uh, robots or even like self-driving cars, they're not RL because that's just not the way to go, at least at this point. Right. What do they use? Do you know? What does a, um, like a delivery car... A, or so a like car Tesla, car? if you look at Carpathy's, um, um like toxic give, uh, yeah, like, like a, that, yeah. yeah. So it's, it's really a combination of, um, so perception would be done by just vision networks. Convolutional neural Yeah, convolutional, convolutional network, but they have like a special way of like merging them. So they call it the Hydra network because you have like so many cameras. How do you include like the different modes nice. and how you like learn to perceive basically. So those are used to um, perceive like objects in a road and also like to construct um, like where's the lane, where's the curb, stuff like that that you should avoid. Right. But then really for um, driving or any of the control, 
they would stick back to like classic, uh, well-known algorithms. Like sometimes I, I, I guess you don't even have to have like deep learning learned algorithms because to drive, like, oh, there's a lane. You can just go straight, turn left. <laughs> So right, right, yeah, right. Sim simple algorithms work in, in those cases. Right. So like even maybe even hard coded. Yeah, you just could. that with this particular signal set. So you're using deep learning to process the information from the sensors on the vehicle. Mm -hmm. um, but then once you have some kind of pre-processed information down to some uh, more simple signals, right. you can just then hard code from there what to do in that scenario. Yeah. Um, and I love that name, by the way, the Hydra. Uh, that's from Greek mythology, I think. It's right. it's a beast with many heads, mm -hmm. and so many exactly. cameras all merged into one kind of perception. And that that's something I think that was big in the Tesla Day twenty twenty one. There's that was some of the highlights was watching uh, how the uh, how that system can take footage from multiple different cameras mm -hmm. and merge it into one concept. And so you could actually they they created a video representation of what that universal concept looks like, and that allows um, even objects that are occluded to remain persistent. Mm, yeah. So, yeah, which yeah. is really cool. Yeah. Anyway, uh, so yeah, so big limitations, sample inefficiency, and limited generalization. Do you have any other big limitations today? Yeah, so we also have reproducibility. Um, that's more of a research problem, uh, I would say, because, of course, when you publish something, it has to be reproducible. So if you release code, somebody else implements the same thing from your paper, the performance has to be, um, you have to match the original. Right. But it's been really hard because um, there, there's, there's the engineer aspect of it. So like, uh, if you implement something in TensorFlow versus PyTorch, even if you like, are really meticulous, but then there are like some background details, like little math that they do differently could lead to different performance. Right. Um, or even just like tiny little details, if you like, shift the certain steps in, in, a, in a network update that might also like destroy your performance. Yeah, yeah. Even library versions can be a nightmare where like uh, in my book, Deep Learning Illustrated, and so if you, use the, um, if you use the Docker image from my book, Deep Learning Illustrated, for the deep Q learning network that I implement in that book, it trains extremely quickly. So it learns to play a very simple game uh, called Cardpole. Uh, which is like the hello world mm -hmm. of uh, reinforcement learning. And uh, it's, it, it does every episode of play on my laptop, like it'll do 10 or 20 episodes per second. Um, so 10 or 20 rounds of gameplay. But in videos that I made later, using Google Colab and using more recent versions of, I don't know if it's a later version of TensorFlow or Keras, but it's extremely slow. And I have not been able to figure out what the difference is. And uh, I just apologize. Eventually, I just gave up and was like, well, if you want this to execute a lot faster, yeah. go back to this old Docker image that I yeah. have, where some, for whatever reason, yeah. it's 100 times faster. Yeah, th these things happen, especially if you jump like a major version, then they change. So for example, they could change the initiation function of, of, of a neural network without you even like noticing. Right. So those things lead to different uh, performance, but also just in general, deep reinforcement learning is notoriously hard to reproduce. Partly because there are so many moving pieces that you have to get right. So it's not just the algorithm. You have the deep neural networks. You also have the algorithm that collects and then recalculate your, your um, values and then pass it to the network. And there is also uh, pre-processing from the environment. So there, there are different, many different things going on at the same time. And to get them all right, and exactly matching whatever the, the author was using, that's really hard to do. And it takes a lot of time. So that, that's, it's, it's no wonder that it's a, it's a problem. Right. Um, and then two other problem, well, yeah, two other big problems that still remain would be reward design is still a very difficult thing to do in right. reinforcement learning. Especially in the real world. Like you were saying, it's easy, okay, if you're playing Tetris, then there's lots of little actions that lead to an increase in point scores. So it's easy to define the reward right. function and what we should be optimizing for. But then you already talked about the example of Montezuma's Revenge, yeah. where it's very rare to have a point score go up. Mm. Um, and then so then in the real world, you don't have any kinds of point scores <laughs> that exactly, are innate. Exactly. Uh, how do you have like, yeah, for driving a car, mm -hmm. yeah, how do you define the reward function? Right, yeah, hitting a curve is minus 10. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so, so it's also, 
So in game, it's a matter of whether or not you are able to learn more efficiently. But in the real world, that could also mean like catastrophic uh, consequences. So with the wrong reward, uh, reward design, the, the lighter case would be, oh, your robot uh, doesn't work. The worst case is your robot causes that real world damage that hit something or hit a person. That's like even worse. Right. Um, and yeah, like I said, life, real life has, has no like reward scores that are like displaying in front of you. Oh, if you go this way, you get certain points. And there's also a matter of, even if you specify a score, it's hard to get it to do what you actually want it to do. So because it was, so in the, the scenario would be called uh, reward hacking because in gameplay, it would be finding loopholes to get a really high score, but doing totally wrong things. Right. But in, in real life, that could, uh, that could just mean like unsafe AI. So it's a big discussion in AI safety. So to, in order to have a, an AI that you can kind of trust and not kill someone, you have to have a really, really careful, uh, careful design reward signal. Right, right, right. Um, so yeah, that's another, and you have one more, one more. Oh yeah, so it's, it's, uh, it's more engineering, so it's just the cost and complexity of uh, deploying such a system. So because you need so many frames uh, to train, it's the cost of collecting data, cost of uh, running the algorithm, and then deploying it in, in the real world. So in a lot of scenarios, it just becomes unfeasible. Right. So like the, I think the Dota uh, bot and the chess bot, last time I looked them up, they weren't deployed actively as like a trainer for people. Because I, I guess one of the, the limitation is the cost of actually doing that on scale. Got it, got it, got it. Um, all right, so despite these big limitations, which give a lot of uh, researchers things to do, <laughs> um, we still nevertheless see a lot of powerful industry applications today. Um, so robotics, you mentioned, is, is one thing. So listeners can go back to episode number 503, where we have Professor Peter Abiel uh, focus a lot in that episode on deep reinforcement learning applications to robotics. And Peter Abiel is perhaps the biggest name that has ever existed in uh, real world deep reinforcement learning applications. So that is definitely an episode worth um, checking out. Um, what other kinds of industry applications or industry trends do you see out there, Kang? All right, so I would start from uh... Like a textbook example, so if you look at control theory or reinfor reinforcement learning, so the typical applications are robotics, you have uh, logistics. Um, a really popular example was the optimization of the, the heating system uh, that DeepMind uh, applied. Right, to the Google uh, like server warehouses, right, exactly. data centers. Right, so kind of have like a, a streaming signal, you have the, the heat, they have to use minimum cost to achieve what you try to uh, like cool down your servers, basically. Um, you have, so logistics would be something like a routing problem. So there's, there's a, a challenge on AI crowd that always uh, comes back like year after year for I think three years now. Um, it's basically applying DeepRL to solve a routing problem of trains. So how do you get trains to arrive on time or how do you figure out the most efficient uh, scheduling of trains? Right. And you, you can, in, in principle, apply that to like the subway in New York, for example, right. which really needs um, uh, optimization. The, the, the New York subway system has such bad sensors, it'll never work. <laughs> they can't even, even with human operators, like yeah. too many things break down. Yeah, exactly. Um, it's actually really funny. I don't know if I'll be able to find it for the show notes because it's many years ago now that I was reading it. But if, if you live in New York and take the subway, there's, it's unbelievable how often you hear you'll be in between stations and, and the train just stops. And then the, the driver will come on and say, sorry, we're, we're being held back because mm -hmm. of a signal problem yep. on the tracks. And so somebody, I can't remember who they write for, maybe it was the Atlantic, but they, they went and they tried to find like, what are these signals and how do they work? <laughs> and it turns out some of them are like 100 years old yep. and you can't buy replacement parts. And so there's like one shop in New York that tries to like solder back together things. <laughs> um, but... Yeah, anyway, so yeah, that's New York. Uh, I, I digress. Okay, so cool. So robotics, logistics, energy logistics, saving. Um, yeah, inventory management is very oh, typical. Yeah. And also actually a, a up and coming um, area for applying that. And you do see like startups already doing that. So the, the problem is to, to manage inventory. What, what, does that, what does that mean? So we imagine you have a store 
um, your your stock could be like grocery items or even like a warehouse, then you be anything that comes in. You have to figure out, oh, how much do you need to keep in, in store? How much do you have to ship out? What's the rate of in and out? And like, what's the cost of storing? Because there's like real space consequence and even like uh, the climate control in the warehouse, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So applying that to um, really manage it uh, as a whole, like full system end to end, as opposed to just say using plain deep learning to predict, oh, how much is going to come, come in? How much is going to go out? But then these startups, if you, if you look at them, you can also clearly see that they are using a hybrid because again, like the, these problems of deep RL are not going to go away like this year probably. Um, so there are certain parts where you, you really need like um, simpler approach to, 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 so for example, like the inventory in and out, you can just use plain deep learning to predict that or like a time series prediction. And then once you have these pieces, as like simplified signals, and it can okay maybe pass it on to a RL algorithm to to do the whole thing mm -hmm. for optimizing. Um, but yeah, that that's pretty much it. I I don't think, like I mentioned before, it it's not applied in, it's not being deployed as like a trainer for um, chess or Go or even any of the cyber games yet. But hopefully, when the cost comes down, we're gonna see more of that because it can be useful for certain people. Right. Cool. So. You have a lot of personal experience with using uh, deep reinforcement learning. So in your book, Foundations of Deep Reinforcement Learning, you talk a lot about a open source framework that you and Laura developed mm. called SLM Lab, which um, is, uh, it has a great name, which <laughs> I didn't know for a long time. Um, but so maybe tell us about the name and then also tell us what this, uh, what this framework allows you to do. Yeah, so a really good friend of mine, Laura, and I worked together to just initially learn about DeepRL because when it first came out, it was really interesting to us. Mm -hmm. And then we just kind of started coding up all these different algorithms and eventually consolidating and refactoring them into a framework. And eventually that framework become SLM Lab. Uh, SLM stands for Strange Loop Machine. Mm -hmm. It's um, pulled up from this really great book called uh, GB or uh, Gudo, Escher, and Bach. Yeah, um, yeah, we re really love that book, and it was really that's a frequent recommendation of guests on the podcast. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Douglas uh, Hofstadter. Right, um, and it's a really delightful book because it's not mathy; it's it's just like words, and anyone can really read it. But the concepts in there are really interesting. Um, so yeah, we have that. Um, we we call it a, a SLM because again, the loopy nature of RL. Uh, seems fitting at the time. Right, right. So right. that framework um, was really useful in helping us kind of organize the the structure or or the the topography of DeepRL, like what algorithms, uh, how they classify, how they relate to each other, and that really helped us uh, understand um, sort of the landscape and then how what are the pros and cons of certain uh, algorithms. And then eventually that was used for the book that we wrote, um, Foundations of Deep RL. And that, that just, uh, that was very, a uh, very fitting application uh, for it because, the, oh, wow, since we have this framework that kind of organized the algorithms in, in ways that we, we think was really helpful for understanding. Yeah. And also like, it, it's pretty straightforward to translate from say what you see on paper and theory and you explain that in, like, in terms of, oh, what, how does the algorithm work? How does the learning function work? And then you get to see that immediately in, in code. So that introduces less, like, less, less hoops to jump through for when moving between code and uh, yeah. theory. I, I love it. And so whether it's the actor critic algorithm or a deep Q learning network or the reinforce algorithm, you can explain in the book how the algorithm works, the math behind it. Right. But then if the reader doesn't want to implement it themselves, they can run it. They can go to the SLM lab and they can get this agent right out of the box that works. Mm -hmm. And a cool thing about their, your framework is that you can plug that into lots of different kinds of environments. So you have the agent, it's going to work, you might need to adjust some parameters for some particular environment, but you can plug into uh, several of the big uh, environment uh, packages that are out there, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so out of the box, it works with the, the classic Atari suite, because oh, we have to. Mm -hmm. um, there's also integration to 
the, the Unity ML agents. So we have had um, contributors who also came in and hey, I, I need to apply this to like my, my, um, my thesis, for example. And I'm working on Doom. Like one, one, um, one person who reached out was working on the classic Doom game. Yeah. And so he ended up writing the, well, the, the integration for that. And so, yeah, because the, the, the framework, the, the API sort of defined the interface to the environment. So once any, anybody that follows the, the same um, interface, you can just easily plug it in. So currently we have that for Atari, we have some Doom games, we have Unity, but I think, yeah, that, that's pretty much it. Cool. Um, and then, uh, so not long after you started working on the book and you were developing SLM Lab, you also started working, applying deep reinforcement learning as your job. Right. So you became an AI engineer at a company called Machine Zone. So what does it mean to be an AI engineer? What does Machine Zone do? All right, good question. So at first I got hired to do uh, game RL. So that's a really straightforward application of reinforcement learning. Um, so you're building like uh, like the enemy, the bad guy in a video game or something? So yeah, it would be a game playing agent that learns and then that would be, so in classic uh, computer game AI, so we call them like good old fashioned AI, they're they are called AI, but they are typically programmed by hand. So if you right. play something like, uh, I don't know, like, like Dota, for example, for a long time, the AI was programmed by hand, like in a file, you can actually go in and modify that. Right. Um, but then, so this would be something different. So actually applying RL, um, as your opponent that it can play against. So kind of like make it more and more challenging. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that, that's one um, application of, of RL that's really straightforward. And yeah, again, back to the question of what does it mean to be an AI engineer? That's, that's a very good question. Um, so I, I think it depends on, of course it's different in, in different places. And in my particular case, because uh, we have a small team, so I end up doing things end to end myself. So in my case, um, it's a whole package. So you go from understanding, understanding a problem and then figuring out how to solve it. So that means, like, okay, what model, what method do I use, what algorithm do I use, or if I have the data, and then to coding up the, the model. And of course, you have the whole, like, there's always like a, a phrase that says, oh, maybe modeling is like tiny 10% of the whole work, but in a lot of it is engineering. That is very true. So I do all the engineering as well. So that includes handling the data pipeline. The data engineering. Right, yeah. data engineering stuff. Um, and also like deployment stuff. Like ML yeah. engineering. Right, ML stuff. engineering in general. So yeah, a lot of, a lot of time is spent on engineering. Um, so really the modeling is the easy part. Yeah. But the engineering is the real, the real work that yeah. I have to do. Which is why if you're listening, and you think you want to get in, if, if you aren't already involved as a practicing data scientist, that is a really big key point, which I'm sure we've talked about on the show before, is that the big bottleneck isn't in model training, it's in deployments or data engineering, getting the data in. Mm -hmm. So if you want to get into the space, being a great engineer, a software engineer, is a, is, you're going to be even more valuable. Like it's great to be a data scientist, and there are lots of opportunities for data scientists out there, but there are an order of magnitude more opportunities for people who can uh, engineer data pipelines or deploy uh, machine learning models into production systems. Exactly. Yeah, because the, the combination is, is pretty, I would say, mentally taxing because you have a lot of things to keep on top of your, of your mind and like, keep up to date. So, yeah. So what kinds of tools and approaches do you use uh, day to day that so, you're to keep up to date? Oh, to keep up to date? Yeah, I mean, no, no, not to keep up to date. I just mean, what are you needing to keep oh, up to oh. date on? What are the tools that you're using day to day? That... All right, so uh, if I were to list them out on my resume, it would be really simple, just three <laughs> items. Um, Python, um, I happen to use PyTorch, um, yeah. and Kubernetes for deployment. Yeah. So because I have to manage deployment. Um, but yeah, in terms of like data pipeline and stuff like that, that's, that can be anything. Uh, so even in the same company, you could have like, a few different pipelines that come to you, but really it's just like figuring out how to plug into them uh, in Python. So just just the big three. Right, right, right. So Python is the programming language of choice for you and most data scientists. PyTorch is the particular automatic differentiation library that you go to 
which I totally understand it is uh, a lot more fun than the other, <laughs> uh, the big alternative, which is TensorFlow. Yeah. Uh, and I'll try to remember to put in the show notes a link to uh, a 40 minute talk I gave on TensorFlow versus PyTorch and why you might choose one or the other. Um, and actually the spoiler alert is that you might as well just learn both. They're yeah, exactly. pretty similar mm -hmm. actually. And they become more and more similar all the time. Yeah. Uh, and then Kubernetes you're using for managing your deployments. So, um, uh, so I already talked about Docker images earlier with respect to library versions. So you can have, uh, Docker allows you to have a very specific library version um, and that way you can have all of your library versions that you know play nicely together, mm -hmm. working together nicely, yep. and be separate from whatever else you have going on on a given machine. Yeah. Um, and so that's Docker, and Kubernetes allows you to take those Docker containers and deploy them into production systems and have them scale up depending on need and that kind of thing. Right, right. And also, when, when you're deploying a system, an ML system in general, uh, industrial um, setting, a lot of times you also have to play with the other like other pieces, like okay, you, let's say if you do something as simple as like serving a classifier, then you have to think about oh, how does the image come in, and then how does it go out, and then you have to consider about like little things that usually in research you wouldn't think about. So for example, like the performance, the uh, the latency would be very important. So all of that also uh, is an art. Um, that's where like engineering comes really really important in terms of allowing for, for an ML product to be useful in the real world. Nice, super cool. All right, so uh, very cool to hear about how deep reinforcement learning is being used in industry today. What do you think is the future of reinforcement learning in industry? So I think we still have a long way to go for sure. Um, there are problems that have to be solved. Of course, it would be nice to start seeing like deep all in, in our daily life. So like delivery robots, for example, or like mm -hmm. more agile, more useful robots. So imagine something that does your, your laundry. <laughs> so that's, that's a really big, um, that would be a really big time saver for people. Right. But yeah, there, there's still a long way to go. Um, I think the, at least the near trend would be, we have to solve the sample efficiency problem before we can leap over to the, the real world. Right. And also generalization because the real world is so much more complex. Like you might spill a cup of coffee and then your robot just doesn't know what to do. Um, and I think just in general, the distillation of um, the technique as well. So you're seeing the open end of play, for example, or the Dota bot and the D-mine alpha, alpha, the alphas or the muse. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So those are not as distilled in the sense that like engineers, like, like you, you and I during our free time, we can't just, okay, go on GitHub, clone something and start playing with them. Um, classic algorithms like DQN, they have gotten to that point, but these more advanced and also more expensive algorithms are still not, um, not there yet for clear reasons. Also, they are incredibly complex, a lot of pieces, and also very expensive to run. Mm -hmm. So we're just getting to a point where GPT, again, it's not like, it's not for everyone to run on their laptop. Um, because of the, the compute costs required. But I think these are the really important problems to solve for RL to become useful uh, in the industry. Cool, awesome. Um, so does that also kind of cover, I know you had some points on what's really cool in research today, um, but yeah, yeah. Do you, so do you have anything like, are there other, other big things yeah. going on in research that could bridge these, some of these gaps that you're describing, sample inefficiency, right. generalization. Right, so we, we did talk about the idea of like computation history and how does that really tie to uh, sample efficiency. So either, so either like a better learning algorithm, we haven't had like a new RL algorithm in quite a while, but back in like 2017, you see like they, they pop up every, every month, you have a new algorithm. Right. So we, we don't know if we're already like hitting the, like a saturation level for, for that. Um, but then the, the DeepMind work on open-ended play is really interesting because that also ties into this idea of um, like emergence, like emergent behavior. And that's how, so like Eric Jang said in his blog post, so when you should, why you should ask for a generalization and not the like specific task of, of let's say, oh, 
do thing X and X, and then you just train for that. Because, well, we humans are the best example that we have reference to. Um, and that's how we sort of learn. So you don't specifically learn something. You kind of like play as a child and understand the world um, without knowing that you were, you were learning about these concepts. Yeah. You don't know whether you're going to become a fireman or yep. an AI engineer. Yep, exactly. So <laughs> open ended play, I think that trend is going to continue. Like uh, more complex environments is going to be tested on. Um, because like if you look at the, the blog post, um, there are just block worlds, but there are complex block worlds. So there might be things like, um, for example, for example, for an AI, uh, AI to learn about texture, like whether or not something is hard, do I grab it uh, with a lot right, of force or a very right, little right, force? Right. So that is very hard to do in, right. in a simulator. Oh man, an egg would be so tricky. Exactly. An so, egg looks so firm. Yep. <laughs> but if you if you, you crush it, yeah. So or like something like um, fur yeah. or hair. A puppy. Yeah, a puppy. Poor so puppy. like, is it? So if you look at it, <laughs> so and that's the sort of thing. If you just if you are a super supervised learning algorithm, if you look at a picture of a puppy, you would think, oh, the fur is hard right because it doesn't move you mm. can't tell so we mm. know because we have experience with them yeah so yeah open-ended play um, more emergent behaviors um so we're, we're gonna see more of that for sure and i think there is so like you said uh with general um uh, going going towards like general uh, intelligence basically like learning from human as an, as an uh, example we're starting to see uh, there's this uh, really old work uh, from Gibson. So he wrote this book um, that basically talks about how we perceive in our environment and how we basically like yeah learn learn from the environment. So we start we're starting to see like researchers in a field applying these um, ideas from you know, the seventies, the but they're really valid ideas and very interesting to try out. And we're starting to see some of that. Uh, as well so that would be yeah I, I can't wait to see what to come up with nice uh before we get to a book recommendation to kind of wrap things up here there is one thing that i want to ask you about so you get a huge amount done in your life so you're an ai engineer which is a highly challenging career to begin with but then on top of that you're doing a lot of open source development you've written an amazing book and so do you have any productivity tips so for example i've noticed that you seem to always be wearing the same outfit. <laughs> yeah, all black is the way to go. Um, well, that's actually a productivity tip because if you're wearing always the same thing, you yeah. don't have to waste time to think and choose. And it goes with everything. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, yeah, so I mean, so when you open your wardrobe, is it like a lot of the same black t-shirt or is it different, like from different brands? No, it's the same. It's all the same black t-shirt. It's almost like factory issue. It's the same over. <laughs> it's like in it's like your cartoon character. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I do change daily, so don't worry. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. Um, that's awesome. Well, I, yeah, I, I really admire that. I, I wish I did it. It would it is it, you know, it's even if it's not a huge amount of your day, it mm -hmm. is definitely some of your day it goes to your wardrobe decisions and why not eliminate that? I think mm -hmm. it's a really good idea. All right, so then what is your book recommendation, Kang? Okay? So my book recommendation would be um, Gibson's book. So um, it's called The Ecological Approach to Visual Perception. It's a pretty old book. Uh, it was published in 1979. Mm -hmm. So actually, do you know Don Norman? Or, I don't know Don Norman. So The Design of Everyday Things. So it talks about human-centered design. So Don Norman knew Gibson, and they're, they're actually working at the same place. So he took uh, his ideas and applied it to uh, industrial design. So that's why I have this like human-centered design. Um, so the ecological approach to visual perception is really about how we perceive. So in the course of his professional life, uh, Gibson basically um, was hired by the, by, by the military to solve this problem of like vis visual perception from the air. Because if you're flying a reconnaissance plane, how do you tell oh, what's what? Um, or like how far are you from the ground, stuff like that. And then there are like mathematical, idea, math, mathematical ideas about, oh, do the triangulation and uh, figure out. But then realize, he realized when something's so far away, it doesn't matter because uh, we, can't, we can't resolve it, uh, that finding as well. Right. Um, so a lot of the ideas, well, without uh, spoilers, um, 
they are actually about this concept of being in the world. So just you have a, a creature. So it's not ex exclusively about humans. It also talks about animals and how we move around our own environment and how we had to learn to perceive like things as like coarser um, categories. So it's a really uh, fascinating reflection also as like uh, as a person and also as someone who works in an AI field. Right. Because you get a lot of like, inspiration uh, from that as well. But yes, also like, just to understand um, yourself better. Right, right. So that, like how our mind works to go from specific instances to more general cases. Um, that too, but yeah, but mostly it's really down to earth uh, examples of oh, how do I know a cliff is a cliff and I'm gonna die if I step off a cliff? Right. Um, cool. And how the yeah, how does an animal uh, learn that? Nice. That's a very cool recommendation, Kang. Um, all right. So clearly, you have a incredible depth of knowledge on reinforcement learning, particularly industry applications. So how can interested listeners get more from you? Obviously, we have, they have their, your book, they have your open source library, but is there some way to stay in touch with you? Ah, well, I would say email. I'm pretty old fashioned. I, I <laughs> okay. don't go on uh, Twitter or any other social media. But yeah, email, you can find my email on GitHub. Nice. All right. So we'll be sure to include your email in the show notes. And if people want to work with you, you have some openings, right? Oh, yes. Um, we're hiring. So I work at AppLevin now. So Machine Zone is a studio under AppLevin, so I'm in this particular studio, and we're hiring for ML engineers. Yeah. Um, so both Machine Zone and the, the, the umbrella, I mean the... the yeah, the, the acquiring company. So, you had, right. so Machine Zone, which you started working at in the Bay Area mm -hmm. years ago, they were acquired by AppLevin, right. and they're both the, uh, the bigger company, AppLevin, and Machine Zone specifically, the studio that you work at. Yeah, uh, they're, they're both hiring machine learning engineers. Right. right. So yeah, AppLevin mostly it's a leading marketing platform for apps, and of course we're hiring in general uh, for all roles, including ML engineers. But also specifically, my team uh, at Machine Zone is hiring a monetization engineer and ML engineer. Cool. All right. So there you go. You could be working right beside him all day, remotely. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for the most part, probably. Um, all right. Kang, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you for coming in person to film with me. It was so much fun doing it this way. And uh, yeah, looking yeah. forward to uh, maybe having you on the, on the show again in the yeah, future. Yeah, totally. It's good to be back. Good to see you again. Nice. All right. Thank you, Kang. Thanks. How fortunate we were to have a deep, deep reinforcement learning expert like Kang on the show today. In today's episode, he filled us in on how reinforcement learning is vastly different from other machine learning approaches like supervised and unsupervised learning. The timeline of reinforcement learning breakthroughs from the 80s and 90s like actor critic algorithms and TD Gammon through to the game-changing emergence of deep reinforcement learning in the past decade with approaches like DeepQ Learning, AlphaGo, and Mu0. He talked about the limitations of DeepRL today, such as sample inefficiency and limited generalization. He talked about how current and future deep reinforcement learning research may overcome these limitations, display further emergent behavior in open-ended play, and become widely applicable across autonomous vehicles and everyday robotics tasks. And he told us about his open source SLM framework that enables you to use state-of-the-art deep reinforcement learning agents out of the box in Python across a range of environments from Atari games to Doom. As always, you can get all the show notes, including the transcript for this episode, the video recording, any materials mentioned on the show, the URLs for Kang's LinkedIn profile, as well as my own social media profiles at superdatascience.com slash 551. That's superdatascience.com slash 551. If you enjoyed this episode, I'd greatly appreciate it if you left a review on your favorite podcasting app or on the Super Data Science YouTube channel. I also encourage you to let me know your thoughts on this episode directly by adding me on LinkedIn or Twitter and then tagging me in a post about it, your feedback is invaluable for helping us shape future episodes of the show. All right, thank you to Ivana, Mario, Jaime, JP, and Kirill on the Super Data Science team for managing and producing another deeply educational episode for us today. Keep on rocking it out there, folks, and I'm looking forward to enjoying another round of the Super Data Science podcast with you very soon. <laughs>